Welcome everyone. In this video lecture, I'd like to introduce Joseph Pieper's work, Leisure, the Basis of Culture, or it's called in German, Muse und Kult. I'm not going to go too deeply into the text because I simply want to read a few quotes from the two introductions to the English translation of Pieper's work and also tie it to another essay by Pieper. I think though that knowing about this essay is fundamental for everyone and anyone who's interested in, in philosophy and in living philosophically. There's much talk about living philosophically, but without a profound understanding of what leisure is and why it's at the basis of Western culture, there is no philosophical way of living. And it is also important, crucial, to realize the fundamentality of leisure in order to understand why there are legitimate criticisms of academia, which no longer is a real school because it lacks scholae, where the word um, school comes from after all, and which is the Greek word which is translated as leisure. And if you'd like to study pipa and also leisure in more depth with me, there's a link in the description of this video which will lead you to my course on leisure with dignity or how to be idle with dignity. I'd like to read first from T.S. Eliot's introduction. By the way, just as a side note, this is a bit strange, but usually I'd always recommend to read the original text. In this case, I have to say the, the English is almost more elegant, or it is certainly more elegant than the German. Um, but of course, that's just a taste, so don't take my word for it. The introduction was originally written for the first version of this, of, of, uh, of the book in English, was written by T.S. Eliot. And at the time, logical positivism was still, well, what we would now call analytical philosophy. Analytical philosophy was still in its, in its prime, and it's around the time of Quine, I suppose. By the way, this project completely collapsed, of course, and analytical philosophy is at a dead end because you can't formalize everything and because you cannot denaturalize all of language, especially not questions. So, logical positivism is the most conspicuous object of censure. So, this is T.S. Eliot. Certainly, logical positivism is not a very nourishing diet for more than the small minority which has been conditioned to it. When the time of its exhaustion arrives, and it did arrive, I to add, it will probably appear, in retrospect, to have been for our age the counterpart of surrealism. For as surrealism seemed to provide a method of producing works of art without imagination, so logical positivism seems to provide a method of philosophizing without insight and wisdom. So thankfully it's run its course, it's been destructive enough. And it still is uh, ongoing to this day, because now that uh, this, this attempt to dehistoricize philosophy, whatever that was supposed to mean, um, what, what, what's, what's now coming out of this is this unleisurely attempt, well, it's not just an attempt, they're, they're actually doing it, uh, of, of a complete historicization of everything, mashing up all the isms, rehashing and recycling everything without any genuine access. To thinking. So, here is a quote from Roger Scruton's introduction. Leisure is not the cessation of work, but work of another kind, work restored to its human meaning as a celebration and festival. And our failure to understand leisure, Pieper makes clear, means to fail, and I paraphrase Richard Scruton now, is a failure to understand what it means to be human, what is distinct about the human being 
as opposed to animals and frankly also plants and stones. <laughs> so let me now move to Joseph Pieper's own preface, which was written for the English version from 1952. Here he says that the philosophical act is a, there's a, a realm of the innermost circle, that's philosophy. And the philosophical act, which must be understood in the traditional sense of Plato, Aristotle, Augustine and Aquinas, and as they understood it, that's to say, grant this original sense of the word philosophizing to be the true one, and it is no longer possible to speak of the philosophical aspect in the same way that one might speak of a sociological and historical or political aspect, as though one could take up the one or the other at will. In the tradition of which I am speaking, the philosophical act is a fundamental relation to reality, a full attitude which is by no manner of means at the sole disposal of ratio. It is an attitude which presupposes silence, a contemplative attention to things in which man begins to see how worthy of veneration they really are. And it is perhaps only in this way that it is possible to understand how it was Plato's philosophical school, the academy in Athens, was at the same time a sort of club or society, and Verein, as you would say in German, for the celebration of the cultus. This cultus, to look at the German title again. In the last resort, pure theory, entirely free from practical considerations and interference, and that is what theory is, can only be preserved and realized within the sphere of leisure. And leisure, muse, by the way, muse in German has this meaning of, of has a spatial meaning. It is a sphere, really. It's, there is a, a sphere or realm character dimension to, to muse in the in term of the, and this is in the Bavarian dialect. So a leisure in its turn is free because of its relation to worship to the cultus. So what we can see here, and he reminds on the very first page of the book that the word school comes from skolè, and skolè comes from, he doesn't mention this, but skolè comes from echein, which means to have and to hold. So to be able to find a stance or something to hold on to, to take, be able to take a stance in skolè, it's, and he refer, what people refers to is that the metaphysics, Aristotle's metaphysics begins with saying that philosophy only became possible thanks to uh, scholae, to leisure. It's, it's the moment when humans begin to notice that they already are in this grounded sufficiency, and they may already have been. That's when philosophy can come about from this sphere that is scholae, that is leisure. And Pieper reminds his readers at the time to not fall for total work. Totale Arbeitswelt, the total uh, work world. And of course the word total at the time, written so briefly after the Second World War, has certain connotations here. So he sees a certain totalizing, well, let's say a totalizing element to the emerging world of work. A world of work that is not a world, I would say. There's no world shining forth in total work. And to speak with Nietzsche, where the human being is ever more, an ever more finely adapted wheel in an uncanny wheel work, as Nietzsche says. So, to the, the, without leisure as the basis, not just something that comes afterwards, after work perhaps sometimes, there is no even, I would say there's no world. And Pippa reminds us in here, in this book, of the connection between of leisure and cultus. And I'd like to very briefly also refer to another essay by Joseph Pippa, a shorter one, which in English is entitled Corporeal Memory, which was written for the, well, the one, 1,000 years of its existence for the, of the, uh, I think, um, the, the uh, dome or Münster in, in Ma uh, the Mainz Cathedral. Sorry, I was looking for the English word, the Mainz Cathedral. So this was presented in 1975 
for the at the celebration of the of the thousand south cell <laughs> one thousand anniversary of Mainz Cathedral in 1975. Apologies. So there were lectures by Ratzinger and others. But anyways, what 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 he says here, and that's what I want to bring to get bring in touch with with Escher, is a quote from Goethe: "When sympathy goes, memory goes with it." This is a quote from Goethe. If we take it literally, this sentence from Goethe brings to light a supremely human possibility, which is no longer altogether foreign to our experience. The possibility that our sympathies grow so weak that we lose our ability to remember. And I would say this, before sympathy goes, leisure disappears. And when leisure and sympathy disappear, we lose our memory. And when we begin to fall into oblivion, then, well, the monuments to who we are begin to crumble. So, thank you very much.